So um, we have the good t uh, fortune and have the time to answer a lot of questions. I'm sure you have many questions. Uh, we have students and our staff with a roving microphone. I'm going to ask a first question, though. Cheers. So, Dr. Solomon, you left us hanging. <laughs> How do you develop a list? How do you narrow the list? How do you determine who's going to be the preferred providers in the organization? You're going to start off with one question with 23 parts. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, so, it, the proposed rule came out, and it, it became clear that um, the entity itself is defined by the participating physicians. So, whoever goes on that participating list is now going to count towards that 25% of attributed beneficiaries that you need to hit. We thought it was going to be by clinician, and instead, they thought. Um, if you aggregate together, there are going to be some doctors who are just not going to quite have enough. There are going to be some that have a bunch. But if you put them all together, you have to hit the metrics. Um, that seems more fair. Not unreasonable. But if we, we realized that, on the one hand, we wanted to be very collaborative with our specialists in the community. But the more specialists in the community that we put on our participating list, they would be taking care of patients that would be referred to them by external entities that weren't in a next generation ACO, and those patients wouldn't count. And suddenly we realized, well, if we're really nice and we put them in our list, we all may not qualify for um, being an APM. So we need to eliminate all of them. And then came the certified uh, health record. Not everybody's on an electronic record, so we're not going to put you guys on the list. And so we dramatically curtailed who was on our participating list this year with the expectation that there's going to be a, a shrinkage in the number of attributed beneficiaries. So I didn't tell you, actually, the first year we were worried about hitting 10,000. We budgeted for 12,000 and got a preliminary number that we were going to get 18,000. And at the end of last year, we were told we had 25,000 aligned beneficiaries. So we budgeted for 12, got 25. Um, with this change, we expect that probably to come down closer to about 12,000, 14,000 aligned beneficiaries closer to where we want to be. The other thing, by having um, the alignment through physicians that were not in our organization, it, it takes away that connection that you have to those patients. So taking care of patients nowadays is a team sport. It's not just you come in, the doctor takes care of you, knows everything, and then you leave. There's a whole lot of stuff that needs to get done, and it really doesn't need to be done by the physician or, or the clinician if it's a, an advanced practitioner. And um, to have that team do outreach when the person that that patient thinks of as their primary care provider is not related to your group, how do you do that? And it really would inhibit you. So we realized our, the, the physicians on our participating list really need to be the physicians in our medical group and in our IPA. And we have just a handful of physicians that are not in our medical group or IPA that we left on the participating list just because of the relationship that we have with them. But that's, that's where we ended up going with that list. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Question over here, and someone's got the uh, microphone. Hi, I'm Tony Schiff. I'm a healthcare lawyer and a teacher in UCLA as well. Um, uh, Dr. Solomon, I have a question for you about uh, your strategy as a system. Um, I'm personally deeply concerned about the uh, uh, growing uh, uh, Medicare population because I aspire to be part of those folks. <laughs> and what I see is, is that a lot of small groups that do uh, take care of a lot of people, especially in rural areas, uh, in other counties uh, that are not so large as uh, San Diego, San Francisco, LA-based counties, uh, there's going to be a big washout because of the complexity of these laws. What I see with Memorial is, is that it aggressively went out after the Affordable Care Act was passed, and it, it created a medical group model and created an IPA model. And as a 900-bed uh, hospital in its own right, the main hospital, and with the other hospital, Certainly, it has an invested interest in having a sufficient medical staff to provide care for the size of the institution that you become. What are you going to do 
uh, when all of those people uh, are not able to access the types of systems? What's the alternative strategy that the system has, uh, has focused on for the rest of the medical community uh, that we all are going to need? Yeah. So I can, I can focus on the communities that we cover uh, for the areas that are more rural, because for the most part, the areas that our organization covers aren't, uh, wouldn't fall into rural. Um, you see across the country a lot of large systems absorbing physician practices with the goal of moving that outpatient work into the hospital so that they can make as much money in the last few years that they can. And even in, in places like Southern California, you still see that happening. Uh, it's against what is being proposed, it's against where everything else is going, but that is still what we see a lot. Do more for as many patients in the hospital as you can. That has not been the, the focus for Memorial Care. So one of the things I noted in our foundation, we put in freestanding imaging centers, and we've actually redirected a lot of the imaging out of the hospital into the freestanding centers. You can charge 150 to up to 500% more for the same study, same quality done in the hospital. Instead of in a in freestanding center, we made that choice to move it out. Our ambulatory surgery centers, same thing, put them in the foundation, separate it out, and are actively trying to move cases out of the hospital into the ambulatory centers. Again, it's a loss to the hospital, but it's the right thing to do. That is really where those outpatient cases should be going. And we've started to see, not on the Medicare side, because you can't yet, but on the commercial side, uh, patients getting total knee replacements, total hip replacements. Those used to stay in the hospital for a few days. We're doing them in an ambulatory surgery center. They're out within a day, and they're home again much better for the patient, much more cost effective. Um, so the moral care as, a, as an approach for the organization has been um, what can we do to improve the, the, ex the quality that we provide, the experience of the patient, and to reduce the costs. So that, that triple aim really has been the, the goal of what Memorial Care has been doing. I guess respectfully, what I'm trying to drive out, and maybe I didn't express this quite well enough, it, it boils down to this. When you're a major system and you have the support of the community and as a nonprofit, there's a certain community responsibility. My question is, and I, I understand the drive towards efficiency uh, in, in, in delivery of services and why the outpatient model. I'm a big Atoll Gawande fan myself. I read the Hotspotters article multiple times as part of my course curriculum. But what I what I would ask is, is what is the strategy for of the system, if you know, and I realize this isn't your direct responsibility. But since you brought into the discussion the whole system, what is the responsibility or what is the strategy of the system to actually support a medical community that the greater populace, as we move towards population management, is certainly going to need? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I don't know if I can necessarily answer the, the question completely. There are, I mean, there are a lot of things that we do do for communities. One of the more, you know, the, the more needy communities that we have is the Long Beach area. And we do have um, offices like our, you know, some primary care offices in Long Beach that cater to uh, Medicaid, the Medicaid population, the needy population. Um, that's where they get their care. A lot of them get it through our, our clinics in the Long Beach area. But I, I cannot, uh, at this point, just elaborate on anything greater to the, the more rural communities that we're going to provide. Question? I have. Oh, can I, can I respond to Tony's Yeah, please, Bill, well, thanks. Yeah, because I think it's a really good question. Um, the state is working, you know, through the CalSIM grant, through the Innovation Center, on uh, accountable communities for health models. And this idea of, um, which I think is what you're getting at in your question, if I understand it correctly. What, and I think the way, um, you're posing it, what do the systems do to generate this greater community organization for delivery of healthcare and integration of services? The state is actually working on models that they're piloting in a few locations under the CalSIM grant to develop this kind of an approach, which of course we pulled out of the Hotspotters article and even going back to the cost conundrum as well um, in places like Durand Junction, Colorado and <coughs> Minnesota. So, that kind of work is underway. Uh, it's primitive at this stage. Um, sustainable models haven't been figured out, but, uh, but there is an effort to do it, um, which I think is great. Uh, but 
is that really getting at what your question? Uh, yeah, there is a plan. I mean, there is activity going on to do that, to address that issue. The, the problem really is, though, is that it's very expensive to live in California. When we lose this next generation of, of uh, physicians and, uh, and of other providers that, that are affiliated with those physicians, we're going to wipe out enough of a margin that with an aging, growing population, it's very worrisome. And what I see is, is that frankly, uh, the uh, you know the Obama administration, and I'm not an affordable care basher. I'm actually, uh, generally speaking, think that it's a it's a necessary piece of legislation that, of course, needs to be uh, updated and upgraded in some places. That said, we're it seems to me that we are going to ha we have a hospital centric system. We have a system where the, the large facilities have built large programs. Um, as Dr. Lee correctly said, in some places, they take the oxygen out of, out of the area. That's very true for Dr. Lee, very true. So really the question is, what really, what are these systems doing? Because the people that are gonna be working there uh, will not be able to handle the volume of, of, of patients. And we will have, as you suggested also, Dr. Lee, somebody coming in at 2 a.m. to get their, their meds refilled. This is a crazy thing, and it's obviously uh, predictable. Okay. Um, Dr. Needham. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jack Needham, and I'm Professor and Chair of the Department of Health Policy Management. Thank you very much for some really interesting insights into how your organizations are responding, but I really want to push a little bit further on that. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to probably provide a little bit of background because I think some of the people in the room don't have a deep appreciation of all the moving parts in MIPS. Or, or the thing. I sit on the uh, uh, National Quality Forum Committee on Cost and Resource Use Measures. And the comment by uh, Dr. Lee that, that you know, we've got you know, resource use measures that are not resource use measures are very accurate. What we've got are standardized prices. Mm -hmm. So you can't actually earn anything by reducing the resources you use to produce a service. You can only get cost savings by changing the mix of services, mm -hmm. keeping patients out of the hospital, possibly cutting other services. So the shared savings model that's implicit in, in these is based upon shifting and changing the kinds of services that are offered. And that's where people started in doing this. But then there was this concern about skimping, about patients not getting valuable and needed care, but the cost would look great so there was a need to add something to deal with the skimping. Thus, quality measurement became part of these programs. So now you've got a set of quality measures that you've also got to report. There was some concern about building the infrastructure to do this, so now there's health IT minimum services that are also part of whether or not you're gonna get paid under these. And then because there was concern that quality, some groups, do it well, some groups do it less well, some individual physicians do it better than others, and they would get the ones that don't do it that well would be discouraged. We now add another set of measures around quality improvement activities regardless of how well you're actually delivering high quality care. And those four components become the long list of measures that physicians get to pick and choose from as they're trying to set themselves up to do MIPS. That's an awful lot to do. And I can easily see physicians throwing up their hands saying, what do I have to do to report? Because if I don't report, I'm gonna get dinged. But let me report, and then let me keep practicing the way I've been practicing and just hope for the best. So my question for Bill, my question for Jay, is how are the physicians that you interact with responding to this, to what extent can they in fact respond to these incentives and what help are they getting to actually move themselves along to where they're simply not reporting the data because it's required, but actually trying to improve practice in those four dimensions mm -hmm. that uh, MIPS hopes they will. Well, and as we've said, um, most physicians, most rank and file physicians don't understand the magnitude of this rule um, and are not prepared for this. Um, and so CMS has pushed off the, uh, 
qualifying periods and uh, uh, it's going to be a longer trajectory before some of the, the sticks hit um, in private practice. Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, a lot of our frustration with the administration in this rulemaking process has been that um, it looks reasonably good on paper, but in practice it is really well, it's a policy wants yeah. green yeah. program. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not oper it's very difficult to operationalize. Um, and we have a model here in California that goes back fifteen years, the IHA paper performance system, which was a collaborative model which has evolved over time and taken the level of practice from point A to point B in a pretty direct fashion. Um, we had hoped and we continue to lobby, you know, based on the experiences that we've had in California with that type of model. Um, our frustration with CMS has always been that um, they continue to, I think, hold back um, more advanced systems. Um, like fully capitated systems in, uh, that could probably help individual doctors to qualify, to practice. Um, and, and that's been our biggest frustration with the entire ACO program to date is that it's, it's too primitive for California, for a place like California. It doesn't take into account some of the models that we've worked on to relieve pressure on individual physicians um, and to let larger organizations work out the qualifying details and do the reporting. Um, and so we continue, you know, we continue to lobby on that. And I, from my perspective, um, I think what we're seeing is a market response to this in, in some ways. And um, the, for example, um, in the family medicine community, there's a growing number of physicians that are actually dropping out of the insurance system altogether and doing direct primary care. Uh, which is you know subscription model practice. So the, uh, now, is that the answer to serving the health needs of the entire population? Probably not, because you know the, their panel sizes are much smaller, and they will in fact uh, provide more personalized, potentially even better care um, that may or may not involve data. Uh, but uh, but in terms of the patient's sense of value from that care, you know having. Uh, access to a, a trusted physician or a trusted team of providers uh, may be part of the answer to that. So I've, I've certainly seen folks react to, to this idea of, of being measured to death, <laughs> so to speak, um, by moving in that direction. Um, I do think that there are going to be a lot of smolos. Um, since I went with that, I might as well stick with it. Um, who, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, smolos who... Um, will look for uh, ways to partner either with others in their community in these virtual groups. Um, so it's nice to see that, that that's certainly an option um, to kind of, I guess, spread out the administrative burden of the reporting requirements. Um, and I wasn't kidding. I really do think there's going to be a, a, a market for consulting companies that do this for uh, not just large systems, but, but, but I think for those uh, small and, and solo practices because that the, the burden cannot be borne by, by those individual uh, practices because they just don't have the infrastructure to do it. So what, I'm, what I've heard both of you say is basically you think people are going to uh, throw up their hands and get it up. Uh, rather than trying to find ways to actually respond to the incentives on measurement, on quality, on quality improvement activity. No, I, I think that there are going to be some who do um, take the route of, well, I'm not going to accept Medicare patients and just go down the DPC route. And we've seen, certainly seen that. But I do think that um, there are people who really truly believe in this value over volume model because they've been on the hamster wheel for so long and they see that they can't, you know, uh, even if they've got data, they, can, they see that everything's plateaued. And, and usually uh, what that means to me when I'm looking at that is that um, the individual effort of trying to make some of those measures improve has been has exhausted its ability to create change. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to actually create systems of care, which uh, is either through an integrated system or through a virtual group um, or an MSO type organization in a, in a rural or underserved area to help with 
doing the administrative piece of this. Um, and so um, it's sort of a chicken or egg thing, right? Like, are these practices really going to try to start to do this on their own? Or um, are they going to wait for um, you know, these organizations to kind of pop up to kind of give them the technical support that they need? And the answer is probably both. <laughs> They, they have to move and they have to wait. Um, and and it's, it's, it's very uncomfortable. It, it re, I mean, you listen to the stories uh, of docs on the ground, it's, it's very, very uncomfortable. There's a lot of uncertainty about, about how to respond to this. So one, one thing I'd like to just point out is that this, the program that they have, that they've de developed here is, it seems completely new, but it's, it's actually just an evolution of what they've already had in place. So meaningful use is expectation that physicians will be using certified electronic health records technology. They initially started off with incentives, and those have escalated to the point now that if physicians aren't submitting for meaningful use, they're potentially subject to a 4% penalty. And submitting the quality data, PQRS, has been in place for years. And those penalties, there's no incentive. If you don't submit your PQRS data, 4% penalty. And they, they started the value-based modifier. That's just hitting the small practices now, uh, nine or fewer physicians will get an adjustment in 2017 based on the services they provide in 2015. And if they didn't submit PQRS, they're not going to get the value-based adjustment. And that's another potential, and that's another one of these balanced adjustments, but it's another 4% hit. So potentially, physicians next year, nine or fewer who are not prepared, are going to get a 10% reduction in their Medicare payments 2017 and 2018, before MACRA even hits, actually MACRA ends up being a relief because there their maximum penalty is only 4% instead of the 10% that they're going to get hit on um, with the way things are currently. Yeah, over here. Yes, uh, microphone. Okay. Yeah, uh, Frank McCarty, I'm a graduate of this program. And a classmate. And classmate, huh. and classmate, yeah. and a student. My question has to do with community health centers, since Jay is our new medical director down at Venice. Um, and even though CHCs generally, I believe, are exempt, mm -hmm. but there's going to be an effect on us. And I wonder if, if Jay and Bill can comment on that. And Bill's comment was absolutely right. We are, this law, this reg, is hugely, to use a common term, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yes, and so um, the Affordable Care Act, um, going back, uh, the Affordable Care Act presented a really uh, interesting moment for community health centers, particularly free clinics that have historically provided care on a cost plus, essentially fee for service model, uh, essentially waiting for patients to come and to be and and when they're sick they come and they be and they're seen and 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 then we take care of their needs. Um, I think uh, since people have uh, had their insurance card, it's changed a little bit of the nature of the business uh, in community health centers in, in ways that um, I think are moving us more towards this value-based uh, type model, meaning um, there are Medi-Cal capitated lives, uh, uh, which is new. Uh, there's this idea of, um, I know particularly at Venice, there's been a real growth in the use of data for decision making in the last three to four years since the advent of the Affordable Care Act, thanks to the talented people that we have um, working the, the data mines, if you will. Um, and um, I mentioned the CP3 project through that uh, CPCA is, um, California Primary Care Association is spearheading. It's, it's modeled in many ways, uh, and at the sort of congruency in, in three letter acronyms of APM and APM, um, is, is, I don't think it's accidental. I mean, I think there's some, I don't know who devised it, but it, but it makes sense that that's what they're calling it uh, because um, the truth is you can't survive on just volume alone. And, and, and um, so I think it's requiring community health centers to build infrastructure in ways that they um, haven't needed to in the past. So in the last three years, um, we've hired a QI manager, 
We've hired a population health manager. We've hired a PCMH manager. Um, and um, this is sort of new business, if, or a new business model, if you will, for community health centers. And so I think, um, in a way, it's going, it, it's, it's sort of interesting, because I think it's been a, the ACA has been a boon for community health centers. I mentioned Eureka. Um, in the last three, four years, the community health center there has flourished. Uh, it's really grown up um, because of the additional business and the subsidies that come from um, uh, the government. Um, and so I think in response to that, uh, we're going to need to um, kind of be able to deliver on that triple aim promise. Um, but it's going to be um, challenging because um, on the one hand, you need to maintain a certain amount of volume because the payments are still very much modeled off fee for service. And then on the other hand, we have to move quickly towards uh, value. And if the, um, the speed or the acceleration <laughs> Uh, is, is mismatched, uh, that could be potentially disastrous. Um, and so it, it needs to be well managed and uh, strategically uh, implemented. And, and those are some of the challenges that I think um, and opportunities that, that face community health centers ahead. We're on uh, the electronic health record now. I think it's all locations, correct? Uh, correct, yeah. Uh, I think for about five years now. Thank you, Frank. Thanks. Uh, any other questions here? Uh, over here. Um, hi, my name is Koi Parada, and I teach nursing students at Azusa Pacific University. I'm also a graduate um, from the Department of Community Health. And by the way, welcome. Thank you. Here. Well, they're right here, our wonderful <laughs> students. Um, I'm also a graduate of the Department of Community Health Sciences, so it's good to be back. Uh, my question is with all of the changes in the healthcare system, a lot of the implementation has focused on the healthcare system plans and also in the physician organizations. I'm curious to see how your groups, either in the community clinic model, like Venice Family Clinic or Memorial Care Health Systems, um, has considered leveraging the expertise of nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, other allied healthcare providers in not only addressing the growing need of the population but the gap of um, the shortage of providers in certain areas? Great question. Who wants to take it? Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great question. And I think um, Adam alluded to this earlier, um, but I think this idea of team-based care um, is, is really critical to meeting the demands of the population because uh, you can't just grow doctors um, fast, and you can't grow them fast enough, right? And, and Likewise, the, the truth is um, er, there's a lot of lead time to, to create uh, different professionals uh, who, who are involved in the patient's care. Um, I'm often surprised when I uh, meet RNs who are um, literally ordering supplies. And I think about how underutilized their skills are. Um, and then I think about folks like Tom Bodenheimer who would um, say, well, you know, the RN really shouldn't be ordering supplies. We should be, uh, they should be helping to manage a population, um, doing teaching, uh, leading those who are on the front line to kind of uh, provide the care that's needed. And so this concept of um, people working to the highest extent of their license is one that I don't think has been leveraged enough. Um, I, I think, um, I know there have been some turf battles, um, you know, in the state, uh, legislatively speaking, um, but I think um, it's also time to get away from sort of the turf battles and move more towards this discussion about how do we all best serve our patients and, pop and the population of California in teams. And I think there are organizations like Venice and, and uh, Memorial Care where we're really tr um, trying to, um, I guess, innovate to figure out how best to provide that care in a way that's seamless, that's person-centered, that's relational, not transactional. Um, and yet leverage some of the technologies that we have out there, you know, uh, asynchronous messaging, telemedicine has been totally unexplored, uh, an opportunity there for, for folks. Um, but um, I, I agree with you. I think we haven't leveraged the existing workforce enough. Um, Ed O'Neill at UCSF would say that um, <laughs> we actually have the right number of people working in healthcare, we're just not using them properly. Um, and, and I think there's some truth to that, but I also think we were uh, vastly 
undersupplied in terms of the workforce. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, the legislature has been through this um, issue here in California, I think for the last four legislative sessions mm -hmm. over and over and over again, and really can't um, seem to agree on or even understand some of the underlying problems. Um, it's really for uh, the community, to go back to Tony's original question, to devise a system where the right people deliver the right care at the right time for the right price. And um, you are seeing models emerging across the US that encourage that latitude. Um, they're payment driven models for the most part. New York has the uh, performing provider systems under their waiver. Oregon has the CCO model, um, which are mostly ground up organizational efforts to um, align care delivery at a community or regional level um, appropriately under a budget and accountably. And uh, those are the kind of models that drive delivery systems to utilize the right people more often than not. Um, fee for service, the coding system holds us back. Mm -hmm. It holds us back from using people to the full extent of their training and educational experience. And um, while this current model under MACRA is very clunky and might delay that transition initially, um, as we move in our advocacy toward fully capitated models, population-based payment models, it creates the space for delivery systems to determine who should be doing what and when, uh, as opposed to some bureaucrat in DC setting a fee schedule or a standard that requires doctors to do certain things and nurses to do others and discouraging any type of uh, innovation in practice. Yeah, and I might add to that, I, um, I should mention that um, this is day 18 of work at Venice Family Clinic for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but in the 18 days that I've been there, um, uh, I've learned about um, some uh, really incredible innovative ways of delivering care. I, you know, I think a, a really good example of this is sort of co-location of behavioral health specialists yeah. with primary care. And it's sort of inane because um, uh, apparently we can't bill for a medical visit and a behavioral, vis a behavioral visit in the same day. It's not allowed. It, it, does that make sense? Probably not, right? Um, uh, so so that's, a, that's an example of an innovation that we continue to do because it's for the good of the patient and the good of the community that we serve. Another one is um, uh, for our homeless population. Uh, we have 15% of our, our patients are, are homeless. And so you can imagine that a traditional medical model of coming to an office, um, receiving a call or a letter about your appointment, it's probably not gonna work for those patients. And so we have um, teams, teamlets of, um, of a provider and a case manager uh, go out to the street to deal with acute issues that are facing the homeless population, helping them to then navigate back to the clinic and then connecting them with um, home services and with um, uh, behavioral health folks because there's a lot of uh, comorbidity with, with um, uh, psychiatric illness. Um, and it's, I think it's been a very successful model. Um, does it necessarily um, pay in a fee-for-service way? Uh, not yet, uh, or not at all, I should say. <laughs> But, um, but could it be uh, part of a capitated model? Because as you can imagine, a lot of the homeless patients have actually gotten a Medi-Cal card um, and they you know, don't know how to use it or don't know how to navigate the health system. So I think those are two examples of ways that um, clinics and systems can innovate to, and think outside the box to, to really meet the patients where they are. And I'd like to congratulate you on nursing is a, is a great career. There's so much that can be done uh, with mm -hmm. nursing in NR. Everything from just bedside nurse to working um, as a case manager to being a nurse practitioner. Uh, and for our organization, we have nurse practitioners. They do home visits. They, they work in uh, primary care offices. They have patients that they'll take care of regularly. Um, and on our nurse case managers, one of our programs we have is an intensive outpatient, outpatient care model where patients who, not necessarily the sickest of the sick, but those that are really struggling to manage their, their health care, um, the nurse will meet with them face-to-face -face and do motivational interviewing to get from them 
what are, the, what are the barriers that you have? What could you see yourself doing? And to help them take small steps to start to take control of their disease. And those, as they start to improve, they start to see that they have control and then they'll improve much more rapidly. And it's not just the nurses as well. So one of the things we have for is a, a diabetic clinic. Our diabetic clinic is actually run by pharmacists. The pharmacists see the patients, adjust their medications, make sure that they're not just their diabetes is controlled, but their blood pressure, their cholesterol. Uh, the patients will also uh, see a dietitian, will also see a social worker because there's so much comorbid depression. And our, our primary care physicians have found that their diabetic patients get much better care sent to the diabetic clinic uh, manned by the pharmacist, social worker, um, and dietitian than they do by sending them to an endocrinologist. So it's a great program. The problem is we can't bill for those services. Mm -hmm. they, we have to provide them uh, for free because you cannot bill without the physician being there. It doesn't make sense at all. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, any other questions? We have one over here. One of my grad students. Hi, my name is Marsha, and I have two questions. One to Dr. Solomon. When you mentioned that you had to take certain of the providers out of your network, do they go back into a mixed model so they will not qualify for the um, alternative payment model? So it was, when MACRA originally came out, I did some talks to try to educate physicians um, in our IPA about what's going on. And um, at the time, the, the law had come out and we thought people were going to have a choice and we knew we were going to be applying for the next generation ACO. We figured um, everyone who participated would be potentially able to, to um, qualify and also talk to the specialists about yeah, being part of our ACO and even if we don't qualify, at least it will help you get a better score in MIPS and this will be great. And then the preliminary rule came out and we realized, well, that wasn't actually completely accurate. Um, they may be in our participating list for 2016, but they won't be for 2017. So there won't be a point where they were in, in, they did qualify for the APM, and now they don't, because 2016 is not a measurement year uh, for MACRA. 2017 will be the first year of MACRA measurement with payment adjustments in 2019. And so this is um, our first learning year, and 2017 will be our second year in uh, the Next Generation ACO. Total cost of care measurement is emerging pretty rapidly. Um, for example, the CAPTI groups in California are measured now on total cost of care, and it's reported publicly under the um, Office of the Patient Advocates public website. And they've ranked the groups in three categories of average cost per year per patient uh, to deliver services. And so it's Raised a few eyebrows, caused a lot of consternation, that level of transparency, but um, it's moving, you know, the low quality, high cost providers, it's incenting them to move to a model of uh, low cost, high quality as quickly as possible to find out where the gaps are in their systems. So it has an almost immediate, that level of transparency has almost an immediate impact. And that's happening at the same time, it's completely separate from MACRA, but it's happening here in California, it's happening in other states, and it's driving changes in provider behavior as well. There's yeah. a lot of moving parts right now. Yeah, and I, I, I would, um, my, my response to your question would be um, to look uh, further upstream <laughs> and, and to look at some of the root causes of why we have the cost conundrum that we have in this country where we're spending 20% of our GDP on, on health and not getting much for it. Um, I alluded to the workforce issue um, and we had questions about workforce. Um, I, I think the balance of uh, primary care uh, to specialty care is, is off in this country, uh, partly because we haven't done a good job of planning. Uh, we've not had added GME slots, uh, you know, significantly since the mid-1990s. 
um, and the balance of those. And I think a lot of this, a lot of this has to do with our fee-for-service system and the RUC uh, determining uh, costs for different RVU measures, um, which have artificially, I think, raised prices and caused um, sort of improper incentives, if you will, which lead to the situations that we read about in the Gowande article. Um, primary care is really, if you look at the uh, Starfield data, it's, the, it's really the one thing that if you add more of it to a system, you get lower costs. So what else can you say uh, that you add more of and you get a lower cost? Mostly if you add more of something, you, you increase costs. But primary care really is, um, I think, the, at the heart of this. And I think um, we're just on the tip right now because, um, yeah, we're talking about cost. Um, in some way, uh, there's a quote from uh, Paul Grundy at IBM that I love, and he says, um, and some of you may take offense to this, but he says, uh, <laughs> the best way to herd cats is to move the cat food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's essentially what we're doing right now. Right. We're moving where the cat food goes, and that's gonna change the behavior of the cats. And yes, we are the cats. Right. Um, in this, and so um, we'll see how well the cats align themselves. Uh, are they going to go hungry, or are they going to eat well? And and um, you know, uh, I think that's up in the air. But I think some of it has to do with the policy lever of how do we create more of a flood of primary care and more interest. And that's beyond the scope of this discussion. But I but I do think that um, that's an important upstream aspect that's that's affecting the cost in this country. The other thing I want. To that is long term, correct. Yeah. The other thing I want to just point out is that is quality and cost are not opposite. You know, mm -hmm. Good quality yeah. does not cost more. When you do the right thing and patients receive evidence-based care, mm -hmm. costs decrease. Yeah. And that's been shown multiple times. Mm -hmm. And so by emphasizing the quality, and that's assuming you get the right measures of quality, which is that's a whole other discussion. Right. Um, you, your costs should come down. And one of the things you do see some of, these, some of the physicians that are staunchly independent physicians arguing against is don't give me that cookbook medicine and tell me what to do. I know the best way to take care of my patient. And when, when you start getting the data, so one of the things is you um, are a next generation ACO or even as a pioneer ACO, you get all the data on all of the patients that are attributed to you. And some of them really only had a fleeting relationship, got attributed, and are someplace else and have nothing to do with your system. And you see the care that the patients are getting, the amount of services that are not value added, and the outcomes that they get. And there is a lot of excess in the system mm -hmm. that you could reduce the utilization, you could reduce the costs, and you can have much better care for the patients in the end. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, one more question. We're going to have to wrap up. Do we have one more? Yes, we do. Over here. Hi, I'm Maggie Magarecki. Um, I work at the UCLA Health System, so full disclosure that I'm trying to steal ideas. Um, <laughs> That's what this is about. Yeah. It's yeah. idea yeah. exchange. Vividy Partners. Um, Big question. <laughs> um, part of it is getting this, the big part of it is the data. So when you look at this, this population, it's a, it's a fee-for-service population. They've done what they will. Um, getting the data from CMS, it's a treasure trove. But it's a ton of information. It's ridiculous the size of the files that they send. And of course, they send this file that has the name of the patient and a number pertaining to the physician, and this file has the physician name with their number that's attached, and this file has something different, and you have to aggregate all this to figure out where is the patient going, what is going on with the patient, and what are their needs. 
I also work in analytics, so I'm right there with yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a mess. So be able to sort that through and identify who are these patients that may have needs, and then also providing the patient's information to give them the opportunity to reach in. Some of the time, now the patient, and the other thing in the next generation ACO, the patients don't even really know they're in the ACO. And the same goes for our commercial ACOs. They get attributed, and maybe they find out, and maybe not. We send them a letter for the next generation ACO, but how many of the patients actually read the letter? Some of them do, and as an example, uh, shortly after one of our letters went out, we got a phone call from a woman to say, please help me, I'm 86 years old, my husband's 92, he's becoming forgetful, I, I just don't think I can keep doing this anymore, and I just don't know what to do. And there's a tremendous opportunity, we can improve this, this family's life, improve their quality of life, and reduce their ultimate costs, just because they, they had somebody that they could turn to just to look for help, because our, our system is so convoluted, it's difficult to get there around. Part of it then is also our outreach, to recognize from the data who are the patients that are not seeing their primary care physician, they're getting most of their care through the emergency department, or maybe they have a variety of specialists that they're seeing. Um, so that outreach directly to patients and helping them to coordinate care. Uh, that often is another place where we can uh, make a significant impact in their, their care. Yeah, and I, I would um, say, kind of piggybacking on what you said, I think the data is critical, but I think the other piece of that is you really have to empower the people on the front line and to give them systems for how to change. Um, uh, Adam and I worked on an innovation project when I was at Memorial Care, and one of the things that we talked about was, um, you know, we have a healthcare company that embraces innovation. And often what we do with innovation is we put it in a department, or we put it in a silo, in other words, right? Um, and then they get funding for a little bit of time, and then we get less excited about innovation, and then we take it off the mission statement, or whatever happens, right? Um, but what if we flip the model? What if we said instead of we're a healthcare company, or a healthcare entity, or enterprise that, that, that is innovative, what if we said we're an innovation company that delivers healthcare? then what you're doing is you're creating, you're putting into the DNA and the workflow and the day-to-day -day aspects of that care delivery. And I think that's the challenge that we have right now in, in our industry is doctors don't like change. <laughs> We're still in the flexinarian model. It's been over 100 years, right? So we don't like change. So how do we give it a boost? Um, and I think, you know, having been in Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley, um, and a lot of my pre-med friends bailed pre-med to go to tech. Um, the healthcare is ready for that sort of innovation boom, um, and you know how do we, I guess, create the activation energy um, to make that happen? How do we catalyze that? I think that's a challenge that each of us has in our organizations, um, and I think CapG in particular has an opportunity to catalyze that for large groups. Um, and, and certainly has been playing in that role. So I think that I, truly that's, I think, the, at the heart of whether or not we're going to meet the needs of you know, the, the, the population at large. Um, and without thinking that way, I don't think we're going to really fully realize the potential. Well, with that, I want to thank our panelists. If you would <laughs> I want to say to you that uh, the next forum will be November 30th. Please look on the website and please attend. Thank you all for giving your time, and I hope it was rewarding for you. And to everybody online, good night. <laughs> Thank you.